Hello, hello, welcome, welcome again. Uh, I hope you had your good coffee. So, a great pleasure to announce the next session. It's a good friend of mine. Uh, we actually do the same thing, vice versa. So, I also go to Taibo 3 events. I went to the last conference and, uh, and they actually copied our Splash Awards. Uh, they did the Taibo 3 Awards, mm -hmm. which was really cool, which was originated here, by the way. Didn't know if you knew. Um, so, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce Matthias, who is uh, also a Scandinavian like myself, but he tends to live on the other side on the, you know, like a New Zealander. Yeah, I'm back, back in Norway now, but uh, my wife is from New Zealand, so... So, you never yeah. know where he is. So, I'm welcome and uh, thank you for talking about an important topic. Yes, and this is a really important topic, but of course, before we start, I just wanted to say a couple more words about something even more important, me. So I am Matthias Bolt Lesniak, I live outside of Oslo, Norway right now, and I have a wife from New Zealand and two kids. And this talk uh, is actually made by two people. It's not only me, it's also a guy with more facial hair, um, and we've been doing talks separately for a long time, and then we actually discovered that we were talking about a lot of different things, and I was sort of having the, yeah, you've, how many have seen the Barbie movie? Yeah, so I had the Barbie approach, the you can get down from the second floor without stairs, um, and very idealistic, and uh, Jam here, yeah, uh, he had the more realistic and he's got the numbers and the business stuff and all of the other important stuff. And uh, yeah, he's not here today. Uh, his mom decided that he should rather be on an island in the Pacific, so that's where he is today. Uh, so I'm gonna do both his slides and my slides and you can guess which slides are uh, mine and which are his. But Apart from that, I am um, a person who's been working with Typo 3 since 2003, 21 years now, and I am now the official Typo 3 project ambassador. And now you're sitting here and you're thinking, what is Typo 3, right? Okay, Typo 3 is a PHP-based CMS. Never heard about that before. It's also free and open source, also totally new to the audience. It's community driven. Mm -hmm. It's backed by an association. This doesn't sound like anything you've heard about before, right? It's got a long history. We're actually 26 years this year. And we also did rockets for our version 11. So there's a lot in common here. And we are actually really, really similar if you look below the surface. This is Drupal version 10, uh, composer dependencies. It's 54 composer dependencies. We disagree a little bit about what should be in the core. Type of 3 has 98 composer dependencies, but that's not really the important thing here. The important thing here is actually what we have in common. And 33 of those composer dependencies are actually in common between Drupal version 12 and Type of 3 version no, Drupal version 10 and Type of 3 version 12. That's, that's the right way. So we actually have a lot in common. There's been parts of Type of 3 in Drupal previously as well. So uh, we're today not going to talk about the differences. We're going to talk about what's in common. And in the open source world, when you look at these logos, we very often have this kind of infighting where we say that, well, we're better than that. and you're, be, you, you know, you're not good enough at that. And I was at DrupalCon in Portland and Dries mentioned cash tags and that Drupal was really good at cash tags. And I was like, wow, I didn't know Drupal had cash tags. We've had cash tags for 15 years in Type of 3 and I didn't know Drupal had that. And we actually know way too little about each other. And I think that's one of the reasons why we sometimes haggle between each other. But we have so much in common that we need to collaborate. And that's one of the reasons why the Open Website Alliance has been founded. You can go to openwebsitealliance.org and read more about that because yes, we have a website now. It's based on static HTML. Um, yeah. 
But in this talk, we're going to first talk a little bit about open source and that it is freedom. We're going to talk about the business aspects of open source. And we're going to change, to change the world or talk about how we are actually changing the world. So, I'm a member of the Australia New Zealand uh, channel in the Drupal Slack, and suddenly this one appeared. And this is a really interesting article. I think we thought that free and open source software had won, and then this came about. Somebody obviously had the right meeting. Drupal has been really big in Australia for a very long time. And then Australia finds out that they want something like the Netflix of uh, government services. You log in and you can see it knows all of your ailments and what you need most from the government. And somebody talked and they found out that Drupal didn't have exactly the features they needed, but there was this other platform that had something called DXP and it was really cool. And the Australian government decided to invest 80 million Australian dollars into Adobe. And lo and behold, the finished solution built in America was not compatible with the privacy legislation in Australia. Great. So they decided that's the bottom line here to invest a hundred million dollars in. Adobe every year, fun. In the open source world, we have been complacent. We really have. I think we thought we won, but we saw that as well with uh, the EU in relation to the CRA, the Cyber Resilience Act, that people actually don't know open source. The first versions of that legislation was totally wild. You cannot publish unfinished software, stuff like that. Everything we do is unfinished software, right? So look at what happened, you know, in 2001. We had a lot of pushback. People thought that open source was the devil, pretty much. It was the worst thing that had happened to business ever. Yeah, really bad. Yeah, and it's still happening. It's really still happening. But in order to understand what went wrong, we have to go back to what open source actually really is. Point one, what is open source really? Well, of course, open source is freedom. We talk a lot about that. Open source is not only free, it's freedom. And what kind of freedom is that? Yeah, it's lying on the beach, free, as in beer. Yup, we've been doing that a lot. But it, there, there are some other things that are really important about open source as well, about this freedom. Open source is also the foundation for free speech. If we want free speech, truly free speech, we don't want reliance on anything else than open source. Open source is also the basis for choice. The freedom to choose is at the basis of the whole open source concept. And open source is also gingerbread. How many of you have heard the fairy tale about the gingerbread boy? Very nice. Not so many, so I get to tell it. Yes. So there is this. Uh, cottage in the woods with a man and a woman and they really want a child and I don't know why they don't have a child it's either maybe they don't know how to make it maybe they have some other issues but anyway they don't have a child and one day the wife comes up with this great idea that well let's bake one right so she makes the dough uh, makes a gingerbread boy puts him in the oven and a few minutes later, opens the oven up, and lo and behold, this living gingerbread boy runs out, and he's out the door and disappears. And he experiences lots of cool stuff. 
That is what happens to an open source project once you open source it. Anyone can do anything, anything can happen, you lose control, and that's it, right? But open source is also puppy. At the end of the story of the gingerbread boy, the gingerbread boy gets eaten by the fox. And we don't want our open source projects to be eaten by foxes. Well, Firefox is OK, but there, I mean, there's other foxes that we really want to hide away from. And that means that open source is actually not only freedom, it is also responsibility. We have to take care of our projects so that they can prosper and become really something for the world. And we've been talking about this business proposition for open source for quite a while. Um, and the value, of course, of open source is this thing that you can use it and study it and modify it and share it. Those are freedoms that we give to everyone who uses our software. And we can put that into numbers. If you have proprietary software, you have to spend maybe 30 money for a license fee, right? With free and open source software, you spend nothing on that license fee. Someone sometimes says that that means that open source is cheaper. It is not. That is not the way to think about open source. You reallocate that money. You put it into strategy, design, making st things even better. You put it into implementation. and testing and quality assurance. So open source enables you to spend more of your money on the things that really matter. So, yeah, you know, you don't have the vendor lock-in. You have the choice. You can choose the roadmap if you want to. You don't have to pay anything. You can invest the money differently. And you also have better security. This is the US Department of Defense. They are saying that open source is secure because it is open. This openness enables us to do things that proprietary software cannot. It's a superpower. You've got to own the bricks. If you have a restaurant, you're maybe renting a place to have it. You start your restaurant and it's going well and you're paying your rent and suddenly your landlord comes and say, says that, hey, you're doing pretty well. We're going to increase your rent because you're doing so well, right? If you own the bricks, if you own the place where you're doing your business, you don't have a landlord that can do that to you. And that's illustrated over and over that, hey, that is really important. This is a Google translated article originally in Danish. But yes, Danish libraries have been using Microsoft software for a long time. And Microsoft have been nice to them because Microsoft says that libraries are non-profit. And I think we can all agree that libraries, public libraries, are non-profit, right? Not according to Microsoft anymore. One single municipality in Denmark might have to pay 4,000, 40,000 euros more every year to pay licenses to Microsoft instead of buying new books. That is the fact of not owning your own bricks, of using proprietary software, even if it looks free. So free is not the core of open source. Free can be a deception. And it happened again. You might know this uh, software called Shopify that suddenly got a lot more expensive from one day to another. And people thought, well, you know, haha, we thought we had something that we could use, and now we can't anymore. 
That is the situation today. No, we have not won with open source, but we can win. And one way that we can win with open source is by looking at the ways that open source can actually change the world. The real unique selling point of open source software. We talked about Australia, the Australian government. We talked about Denmark and the Danish government. And when it comes to software procurement, there are usually two different camps. You have one camp on one side that says, well, the government should do everything. The government should develop, own, run everything. Don't think about the private sector. There's this other political camp that says, well, no, 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 no. The government should do nothing. The government should have as little to do with software as possible. Everything should be done in the private sector. The private sector should build, run, own, and then the government should just pay for that. That is still proprietary, right? You own something and you don't want to give it to anybody else. Where is open source in this? Yes, I know a lot of you do business with open source, but the open source projects are n neither places here. Open source is actually a part of civil society. Civil society is a lot of things. It can be your local choir where people get together to sing. It could also be the Red Cross. Large organizations where people get together to help others. Civil society is not based on proprietary and being the only people who do something. It is based on creating communities. Communities around interest, communities around need, stuff like that. That is actually where open source projects exist. And imagine if the government could take its money, pay private sector to develop something, and it goes into the civil society to be available for everyone, to serve everyone. I'll come with some examples of that, but here's another analogy of proprietary software. This ladies and gentlemen, is a desert. A desert is a monoculture. It's sand. Well, it might be warm, nice, comfortable to be in a desert. It doesn't rain. You don't need an umbrella unless you need it against the sun. And there's only really one thing you need. You need access to the watering hole. And if you know the guy who owns the watering hole, everything is nice. But what if you come into a disagreement with the guy that owns the watering hole, and he says, well, now you have to pay, and you have to pay more than you earn. Well, you obviously have a dependency on that person, and it's not a positive dependency, it's a negative dependency. These kind of monolithic, monoculture, monotechnical proprietary systems create dependencies. This, on the other hand, is my picture of open source. It's a jungle. And you might say that, well, but these are all fighting against each other and uh, we don't know who's going to win, but no. If there was a situation here where there was a real competition, there would always be one winning, right? But plants in a jungle cooperate more than we are actually aware of very often. This is showing interdependence. The jungle wouldn't work if plants weren't able to work together and be dependent of each other. This is a community. If someone won here, it would end up with a monoculture with only one plant, which wouldn't be good for anybody. Back to the desert, have you been to the beach before? lifted up some dry sand and it just runs through your fingers. You can't really hold a desert in your hand. And what do we do with a desert if we want to remove it? Hmm? Yes, we plant trees. We plant trees and when we plant trees in the desert, it's not like 
that the roots go in and they hold on to every grain of sand. No, the plants introduce organic matter into the sand. That sucks up water and that holds the sand together. The life of the plant, the organic, holds things together. The life holds things together. Community holds things together. And if you look at the government, you know, if government had a hundred money for infrastructure, they might build a bridge, they might invest in healthcare, some invest in other things, maybe not so good, and they can invest in open source. And what happens when open source comes into a proverbial desert? There is an example. This is a map of the United Kingdom. The IT supplier map of the United Kingdom in 2010. Yes, you can see there's four little dots there. And if you can name four big tech companies, that's them, right? That's the supplier map of the United Kingdom. But they made the choice at this point to say that, well, if a contract is smaller than so and so much, we should try to use open source and we should try to involve local business. How do you think the map looked after four years? Yeah. It introduced life to the business in the United Kingdom. They even included a part of Europe. Look. And that is what open source does. So when the Australian government put their money into Adobe and sent it out of their country. They didn't enable their local business. And imagine if the government could be a driver for creating independent local business in countries. Example. One day, the phone rang at the Type of 3 offices. Yes, we do have more modern phones than that. That's just a photo. Uh, but the phone rang, and it was the Rwandan government. And they said that they had 250 Type of 3 installations that they needed upgrading. Hmm, that's a business opportunity, right? So how should we do that? Should we bring in one of our member agencies and say, hey, there's a big job in Rwanda, just go down there, earn some money, fix their stuff? Or could we do it differently? Because very often when you talk about countries in the global south, what happens with business going in there is that they go in, they earn money, they take the money out. Very simply like that. They very often work with solutions that have some kind of vendor lock-in. Even if it's open source, they own all of the knowledge around it. And they create this kind of financial dependence. And to be honest and brutal about this, that approach is both colonialist and exploitative. There is no way around it. That is not a good way of doing it. So we decided instead to use our community to create independent local business and expertise. We took experts from different agencies and sent them to Rwanda to train people at local agencies so that they could serve their government. Wow, the power of open source. You can read more about that um, on our website, but the most important thing is it looked like this. We got help from um, a German aid agency to pay the wages of people learning Type of 3 in Rwanda. And today, Rwanda has more than 400 websites built not by Germans, but by Rwandans in Rwanda for the Rwandan government. Nobody outside of Rwanda has touched their websites. And to put that into a newspaper headline, maybe, it's basically that we, a democratic and not-for-profit open-source project, supported sustainable 
and independent local business in Rwanda. Yes. This isn't only a thing for developing countries in Africa. This is a real thing happening in developed countries like the Netherlands, like Norway, like Australia, every day. We have been complacent about open source. We have been complacent about the real big impact that open source can actually create in society. Open source is not only a solution for your business, it's a solution for society. And you know, Drupal has been really good developing government software in Australia. And imagine how much business could be created if every government understands that this is a way to actually save money and create business. And save money not because it's free, but save money because it's about collaboration. The work that you do on a government website will give you the knowledge and expertise that you can use in new projects, that you can use to expand your business, to serve others in other markets in other verticals. It's a booster package for local independent business. And government, government does not know that. We saw that with the EU, with the process uh, around the Cyber Resilience Act. Some politicians, I've heard, believed at the beginning that open source was just some way that big American tech giants were trying to save taxes. Yeah, that's what they thought was open source. We have to speak about this, and we have to create this locally-led, non-exploitative and anti-colonial way of working with open source that can empower local business, that can empower governments, and create community. I mentioned civil society. Civil society won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2022. We're a part of that. We're a part of that positive movement. Hey, what we do every day is worth a Nobel Peace Prize. Because what's next? Okay, what have I talked about? Well, we have these freedoms that we really have to understand how they work outside of just the software. How do they work in a business situation? How do they work when we expand beyond business? We have to understand how it changes business and we have to understand why and how it changes the world. But yes, what's next here? We have to realize that the values of open source, the values we are working with every day Why is it civil society is so important? Well, it's because the values of civil society, the values of open source, the values of working democratically, the values of peaceful coexistence. Yes, we do that. I know we have arguments sometimes about a patch or something like that, but we actually manage to find solutions together. We don't go to war in open source. We don't like war analogies. We don't compete against, we compete with. The values of open source are the values of a healthy society. What we learn doing open source, we can apply to what we do in the rest of the world, in the rest of our lives as well. And we all know that democratic values are under attack in the world today that people do not know what those, how those democratic values function will affect open source, but open source is also a way to learn about those democratic values. 
Therefore, working with open source strengthens civil society everywhere. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for the work you're doing. So we have questions that we can take because we have a little bit of time. Anyone has a question for Matthias? Yes. Um. My name is Thomas. Uh, I was wondering, the slide uh, you sh have shown at the beginning, at, at the left side, the closed source software, the costs, and at the right side, the minus 30% and the plus 10, plus 10, plus 10. Mm. But I kind of missed the costs for contribution. Uh, and can, you, can you share some insights about that? Yeah, the cost of contribution uh, is actually two different things. One is you can take some of this money and you can reinvest it into, for example, quality assurance or new features or stuff like that. And contribution on the other side is, I mean, very often when I talk about the type of three association and people wonder, you know, how do you earn your money? We say that, well, our main KPI is actually community. The community size, and what the community does. So one thing is what you earn by, of course, putting money into further developing the product. But the real magic happens when you take what you've spent a little bit of money on and put it out in the world so that others can put a little bit of their money into it and spend more time on developing it. And you, know, you can think about this gingerbread boy running out of the house. But by you taking this conscious choice of open sourcing, as much as possible, hopefully, of what you do, your little investment can contribute to creating a whole gingerbread family that can come and help you next time your house is leaking. So you spend that money, yes, but what you get back is, lot, is a lot bigger. It's like you do a really small investments and it gets multiplied by thousands because of all the other contributions. Uh. Yes, and I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Sometimes you have a little project that you only work on yourself. And we've seen that, you know, Log4j, for example, and this uh, uh, illustration that always comes up with that guy in, in some remote American state sitting and working on his piece of code. That is not a problem with open source. It's a problem about not understanding how open source work works and understanding that responsibility that we have to add to the freedom. Mm. Yeah. Um, so for the Drupal Association, what we've been trying to do is that uh, to amplify the makers mm. by giving them a little bit more of a spotlight. Because you're right, the more we contribute, uh, you know, others are benefiting, benefiting for it. So why should I spend money on it, even though it's all for the goods and all the stuff? But like in the end of the day, we need to survive, and we cannot just let the companies that are not contributing get all the products mm -hmm. using the software that we are building. So I think like there, the associations come in place of highlighting actually the makers. So if your company is not already, you know, because all of your companies are contributing a lot. So if your company is not already uh, registered Drupal certified partner, you know, make sure you get into that program because we are going to be highlighting those companies more and more. And these are those who are actually giving back to the software. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why we founded the Open Website Alliance was to start promoting open source generically more. Yeah. I don't think any open source project can ever win, you know, in a fist fight against Adobe's $50 million uh, marketing budget. But if we manage to tell the story about all of the benefits of open source, even before the client has chosen a system, we have made them understand more of the value of making that open source choice. 
And that is something that we can do together. Also because, of course, we share code. We share, you know, if there is a security hole in Type of 3 or WordPress or something, Drupal will also be affected by that. I met a, actually, Jam, my companion in making this presentation, and I have both met people who have said something along the lines of, yeah, I tried open source once, it didn't work. People think of open source as a product. We have to treat it as that product, as that brand name, and make sure that everyone sees why choosing open source is the first and most important choice in choosing software. More questions? Uh, how do you uh, personally uh, incorporate op open source in your daily life? I'm wondering about that. Because we all have these amazing uh, tech companies delivering us uh, things like laptops and uh, phones and all that stuff. But that's not really open source, right? So how, I'm, I'm curious how you incorporate that into your own life. That's really hard. Uh, and I can tell you a story about that because I was um, brought into a meeting with one of Norway's largest labor unions for public sector employees. And they had a problem that their employees had noticed that uh, data from hospitals in Norway had suddenly ended up in India and that was one of the reasons was lack of transparency, for example. Uh, and it is very easy to buy, you know, something with good user interface and very many of these proprietary software platforms and hardware platforms base themselves on the bling, right? The bling factor that you should want it, right? And as open source developers, we often don't focus so much on the user interface, right? It's true. Um, but these uh, other guys who are actually just selling a picture of something, they can focus on that and they don't, don't spend so much time maybe on fixing security bugs. Uh, but one of the things that was suggested in that meeting that I had with this labor union, quite high level, was why doesn't governments then cover that job? Why don't they pay for helping develop good UIs for open source software. And hey, that's actually a really good idea. I was in uh, Brussels a few months back and someone suggested a 10 billion euro tech fund for supporting open source. And I think that's where we need to go and look for the funding that enables the things that developers might not find is so fun, but that we need to do in order to actually be able to create solutions that can compete with the bling, even though we don't like the bling. Did that answer your question? Yeah. So one more question. Hi, thank you very much for this great presentation, really cool. My name is Emil Brock, I am Open Source Ambassador at SUSE, and I'm very curious how you look at paying for uh, subscriptions instead of licenses. So that's, that's one solution, and there are many out there. In Type of 3, uh, we have a platform that is, of course, free. We give it away for three years. But one of the ways that we finance our uh, work, uh, I mean, one of the things we do that I don't think Drupal does is that we pay people's travel and lodging and food at Sprints, for example. Uh, so we get in money. Uh, by thinking past those three years. When we get to extended long-term support, we sell those plans. And that is a kind of subs subscription that helps back in. But the important thing with those extended long-term support plans is one, it's not the first thing we offer. So you get three years. This is if you have an installation that is enormous and the client just doesn't want to invest in an upgrade or new features or those kind of things, then you can sort of get a crutch to, to live on. But that money should be, it should cost money because it actually supports developing new features in the product. That's something that people can understand. I personally 
I'm not a great fan of um, <coughs> software where you have to pay for downloading the open source software. Although I know that that is sometimes the only way developers can survive. But still, if one person pays for it, you have the possibility to distribute it on a GPL license to, to anyone you want. And that's where you know, moral and ethics and all of those things come in. But in a world where we're more aware of these ways that things function, aware of what support is actually needed of taking the responsibility. I'm unsure if those subscription plans are necessary anymore. Great. So thank you, Matthias. Um, please make sure you have a chat with him, but he also needs to run to the next session, I think. Oh, yes. It's uh, in six minutes. Yeah. <laughs> So 